Edwin Crawford Hewitt became the third president of Illinois State Normal University in 1877. Hewitt had been a member of the faculty since 1858. He was hired as an instructor of geography and history, but over the years taught mathematics, literature, spelling, pedagogy, and psychology. In 18 years, Hewitt had witnessed how a dream in a cornfield could develop into a prestigious normal university. And now it was his turn to lead. At the beginning of Hewitt's presidency, the university was faced with a turbulent economy and declining enrollment. In his first report to the board, Hewitt attributed the decline to the demand for teachers and the tightness of money keeping many from attending or completing the courses already begun. The university was funded solely by tuition, so the board discussed lowering the standards to increase enrollment. Hewitt flatly rejected that idea. One board member recommended establishing specialized departments as a way to attract more students. Hewitt reminded the board that all students attending the university were required to sign a pledge to teach, and there could be no deviation from the teaching curriculum. Hewitt was ordered to immediately cut back expenditures, forcing him to decrease teachers' salaries. As a result, some faculty were forced to resign. The regular school year was reduced from four terms to three, with only 12 weeks in each term. Hewitt proposed a four-week summer session to be held in August before the fall harvest. The first summer classes in 1880 drew 198 students, which helped the school survive the rough economic times. Declining enrollments were also occurring in the model school, limiting the practice opportunities for the pupil teachers. So President Hewitt issued a circular to normal parents, offering a one-term tuition waiver to 18 pupils under the age of seven. The response was good, and on a limited scale, kindergarten techniques, which Hewitt highly favored, were introduced. By 1880, the economy improved and attendance was again on the upgrade. Salaries were restored back to $2,000 a year for the men professors and $700 a year for women teachers. Hewitt decided it was time to take up the matter of extensive campus improvements with the legislature. He described the cramped building in need of extensive repairs. He first requested a fireproof building be constructed to house the valuable collection in the Illinois State Natural History Museum located on the second floor. If made available, that space would accommodate two large classrooms. The request was denied. He then recommended a gymnasium be built for physical culture classes. That too was denied. When several other requests for improvements were turned down, Hewitt decided to make the most of what he had. He knew the university janitor had four nice-sized rooms in the basement of the building for his residence. This living arrangement hadn't always been pleasant. The janitor's taste in food ran to highly seasoned sauerkraut, onions, and sausage, and the odor that wafted upward from his kitchen penetrated the atmosphere for learning. The solution came when janitor Peter Kettleson resigned after 16 years of keeping the building clean and running. Hewitt made sure the new janitor was hired with the understanding he would maintain a cottage elsewhere. The new space was converted into two dressing rooms and a classroom for primary children. Further use of the basement was hindered by the central location of the boiler in the furnace room. Hewitt knew if the heating plant were moved outside, a much needed space could be provided for gymnastic exercise. 
Unfortunately, he would have to wait several more years before funding would become available for that project. The building was now 20 years old. Maintenance money had been delayed for too many years, and the building had begun to crumble. During the summer drought of 1880, a well was dug and connected to a pump in the basement. When the water tanks mounted in the attic were filled, they began to leak. Seepage constantly threatened the plaster in the walls and ceilings. Adding to the decay were leaky gutters and major roof damage. The old clock, which had lost so many of its parts it no longer worked, was entirely removed from the observatory. The bell in the tower that served as evening curfew and marked the time for students to go to classes suddenly cracked and fell apart. The town seemed very quiet and lost without the bell. President Hewitt said a new one was imperative. The board concurred, but it took two years before a new bell was placed in the belfry. The 25th celebration of the university's founding reunited many former students and faculty from across the country. Over 220 persons attended the banquet, which lasted for five hours. Charles Hovey, the first president, returned from Washington, D.C. He joined Edwards and Hewitt on the platform for an evening of reminiscing. There was a sparkle and affection in Hubby's eyes as he reviewed the founding of the school and paid tribute to those who supported him in the dark early days. Edwards spoke fondly of the teachers who had helped build the prestige of the university. Hewitt filled in the gaps in reviewing the university's history. It was a heartwarming event to see the three presidents together and served to inspire and motivate those who shared the dream of a great institution for teacher training. When Charles de Garmo returned to the faculty, he was instrumental in forming the faculty club. The club met every two weeks to study the philosophy of education and to analyze the work being carried on at normal. Self-improvement was also of interest to the students. A group of hopeful young men, enamored of Roman history and political thought, created a club they called the Ciceronian Society. Its meetings were given over to debate, oratory, parliamentary procedures, and the study of current issues. The women students, feeling a bit left out, decided to crash one of the Ciceronian meetings to learn about it for themselves. The men were expecting the visit and made no effort to oust their visitors. The girls thought it would be a good joke to bring along their crochet to ease the expected boredom. But instead, they became so interested in the proceedings, they decided to start their own society. The women's group was known as the Sapphonians, after the tenth muse, Sappho, the Greek lyric poetess. Meeting in any room or office that was available, the Sapphonians undertook the study of art, literature, travel, and music. In 1887, the Normal University suffered the loss of its principal founder, loyal friend and supporter, Jesse Fell. He died on February 25th at the age of 79. He was highly regarded by every citizen in Bloomington and Normal. No church was large enough for his funeral, so the services were held in the assembly hall on the third floor of the Normal University building. 1,600 people thronged the aisles, corridors, and stairs of the building Fell helped create. 
After the service, there was a huge cortege leading to Evergreen Cemetery. The pantograph reported that as the last carriage left normal, the first reached the courthouse in Bloomington, where the flag flew at half-mast. Although the board four years earlier had directed the Committee on Training to prepare a course in free gymnastics, the question still remained where to hold the classes. Again, the General Assembly was petitioned, this time for $12,000, to construct a new boiler house and a combination gymnasium grammar school classroom. At last, the legislature responded in support. The boiler house was granted, but the gymnasium classroom was voted down. Hewitt was disappointed, but not discouraged. With the removal of the boiler and the coal, the basement could be used for other purposes. The exercising and calisthenics drills, previously conducted on the upper floors, could now be performed without fear of endangering the building structure. The new space also allowed a corner of the basement to be outfitted with tools and benches, where Professor Reeder began an experiment in manual training with the grammar school boys. One of Hewitt's fondest hopes was having a university library, one place to hold the various reference volumes, documents, and collections scattered about the building. Neither faculty nor students liked the current system. In a bold move, the Wrightonian and Philadelphian societies voted to transfer their books to a general library if the board would provide a suitable room and maintain an efficient librarian. Their proposition was successful, and in 1890, Miss Ange V. Milner was employed to prepare a master card catalog of all the books in the school. The reception room on the first floor was designated as the room to be used for the library. Although the space was far from adequate, Ms. Milner managed to get the new general library up and running so students and faculty could check out books. The administrative work of the university continued to increase throughout the years. The board realized the demands and granted $250 a year for the services of a bookkeeper. For the position of chief clerk, Hewitt employed Flora Pennell Dodge. Ms. Dodge was hired in part because she could operate a typewriter, a rare skill at the time. Flora was a great help to Hewitt, but as the school year drew to a close, the president found himself a little more weary than usual. He had been in educational work for 41 years, 32 of those at Normal University. While president, Hewitt had continued his interests in writing poetry and managing the publication of the Chicago Teacher and the Illinois Schoolmaster. This would be his satisfaction in retirement. At the conclusion of his report to the board on June 25, 1890, Edwin Crawford Hewitt resigned his connection with Illinois State Normal University. The resignation was brief, but not unexpected. The pantograph carried the news of Hewitt's resignation and of the appointment of his successor in the same edition. The mantle had fallen on Hewitt's beloved and respected former pupil, John Williston Cook, who would lead the university into the next decade.